So our next speaker, Dr. Robin Hardwick, is an associate prof professor of general internal medicine and reproductive health services, which includes obstetrics, gynecology, and maternal fetal medicine at the University of Texas Medical School at Houston, where she has practiced since 2004. Dr. Hardwick practices clinically specializing in HIV AIDS, including a focus on pregnant women. Her experience, expertise, and passion is shared with a multitude of nurse practitioner, medical students, and residents she teaches as well as colleagues advised in the clinical setting. She has traveled as a volunteer on medical missionary work to Guatemala for the last seven years and has recently led her first volunteer medical student group to Honduras. Uh, can you all join me in welcoming Dr. Robin Hardwick? Thank you. First, I, I'd like to point out what Stuart so eloquently said um, in the beginning about these stories and how secretive they are. And when I was preparing for this evening, I was wondering how in the world am I going to tell stories, other people's stories, because it seemed just that to me, that I would be telling a secret. So I'm going to talk to you tonight in a roundabout way, um, but it's mostly going to entail my stories and people that I encountered along the way. So my story's not j just one, but it's a compilation of many moments, like adding clay onto a pot onto a wheel. These moments have created me, and hopefully these same moments are going to help me create others that I teach. So let me start by telling you about my weekend. Ironically, I was passing the old Institute of Spirituality and Health, um, you know, the pre-Allison one in the medical center, at roughly mile 24 of a marathon. I began to panic looking for words that I might share with you this evening. Hmm, I thought. Sacred moments in medicine. I'm in need of both a sacred moment and some medicine right now at mile 24. Why am I torturing my body like this, I recall. I don't think my bladder's going to make it another two miles. So do I risk squatting in that monkey grass next to Baylor College of Medicine and risking that someone might recognize me and say, hey, don't you work for the University of Texas? Um, I didn't want that to be mistaken as an insult. So then I started thinking, are my feet even going to carry me another two miles? Uh, my two friends that were with me, they were already petering out and several blocks behind. So I, I was trying to physically capture, is it really just two more miles to the inner village of Rice? It has to be shorter than that, I kept telling myself. So please, Lord, bring me some wings or at least some strength for these last two miles. Blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. I could not see Rice Village, but I did believe that it was less than two miles. So at the age of 13, I began my medical career during the summer of 82 in pink and, pink and white pinstripes. Some of you might remember that. I was a candy striper. I just completed the eighth grade and I was assigned to deliver flowers and mail the day I walked into the room of Mrs. Player, my eighth grade English teacher. Whoa, I thought, what is she doing here? Why do I have to deliver flowers and mail to the woman that just made me suffer the entire last year? shaking her finger in my face every time I answered something incorrectly. What did I do to deserve this? I wondered if she was as surprised as me. I handed her the mail and I practically ran out the door and down the hall as far away from the room as I could go. The next week I had to make a delivery to her room again. I tried my best to get one of the nurses to take her the mail, but no such luck. I waited around 
outside in the hallway, watching, hoping that they would take her for a test. Then I could get in without any notice. I waited her, for her to doze off. I'd peek around the corners, peek through the door. I'd always hear some commotion, so I wouldn't go in. So my whole shift just about passed when I knew I had to just go in. Just my luck, she was awake. I handed her the mail without so much as a whimper, and I turned to leave when I heard my name. Robin, why don't you sit a while? What? She knows my name? How does she know my name? I'm thinking, you know, I'm a 13-year-old girl. Oh, crap. Duh. She was my teacher for the whole last year. I told her that my shift was ending. My father, who worked downstairs, would be waiting for me to leave. She asked if I would return on another day. I conceded. Two days later, when I returned, I didn't have any mail or flowers to deliver, but sulked into her room as I agreed. I thought if I didn't go, she'd report me to the nurse, the nurse would report me to my dad, just be a fiasco, so I finally just sulked in. She asked me to sit, and she began talking to me about my volunteer job, what the weather was like outside, my hobbies, my excitement about going to high school, boys, and the like. Not once did she ask me about any books I was reading, or not once did she correct my grammar. Suddenly, Mrs. Player was cool. I didn't ask her why she was in the hospital because I already knew from the nurses that uh, she had lung cancer. HIPAA didn't exist so much back then. Actually, we avoided any direct talk or anything specific uh, about her, so I began going to her room daily. Even if I wasn't scheduled to volunteer that day, I'd go to work with my dad and go straight to her room. It didn't dawn on me that she didn't have other visitors. It didn't occur to me to tell my friends that she was there. I would help her with her meal tray. I'd get her pills from the nurses when they were scheduled, make sure she had water to wash them down. I'd change her bed linens when she showered. I even pushed her outside so she could feel the sunshine and she could smoke her cigarettes. Heck, I'd even get my dad to buy her cigarettes for her when he was buying his. Slowly but surely, Mrs. Player's health began to decline. She became more frail and weak. I sort of noticed it, but must have ignored the fact. I read her mail to her from her family that promised to visit in another month. I reveled in the thought that I was truly becoming Mrs. Player's friend. She was not my teacher, but now my confidant. I took notice to every single thing that those nurses did for Mrs. Player, and I asked them to teach me. This was my awakening moment. There was nothing else in this world that I ever wanted to be than a registered nurse. So one day, Mrs. Player seemed exceptionally fragile. She asked if I minded pushing her to the chapel. Perplexed with this new request, I agreed, and I ran for a wheelchair. I helped the nurse get her in it, hung the IV bag of fluid on the chair pole, and covered her with a blanket. The nurse gave me very strict instructions to have Mrs. Player back to the room within 20 minutes. I pushed her into the chapel, and I left her there alone for about 10 minutes. When curiosity finally got the best of me, as usual, I tried to sneak and creep back in. Now, please know that I just told you I was going to be a registered nurse, so I had bought the best white SAS shoes that there were on the market that all the other registered nurses had. So there was no creeping. Those rubber soles on that tile floor coming into the chapel, I could have been an elephant coming into the room. I was invading her privacy. She called me to her side without even looking. She asked if I would pray with her. What? I quietly sat down in silence as she prayed for the Lord to take and keep her soul. When she was done, I pushed her back to her room, helped her back into bed. I left her that evening with a C in a week because I was going on family summer vacation. When I returned, Mrs. Player's room was empty. I asked the nurses when she was discharged home. They sat me down and softly explained that she had died two days after I last saw her. I'd forgotten this story until now, 
and only realized that sacred moment in the summer of 1982 would be the catapult of my career in both nursing and medicine. I then went on and completed my bachelor's degree in nursing. I moved to Houston and began working in critical care at Methodist Hospital. I was trained to oversee the most critical patients, calculate life-saving doses of medicine, manage the most sophisticated of current technology and life-sustaining devices. I performed countless compressions on human chest, pushed syringe upon syringe of liquid medicine, turned, lifted, and cleansed hundreds of bodies. I witnessed death and I witnessed life. I held hands, hugged families, and wiped tears. I personally experienced emotions of anger, fear, betrayal, and loss of hope. Yet in turn, I witnessed expressions of relief, gratitude, honor, and joy. I saw families hover over loved ones, and I saw individuals alone. I authenticated and I eavesdropped on innumerable sacred moments in medicine in my eight years in that CCU. I then moved on through graduate school, becoming a nurse practitioner and experiencing similar moments through people's trauma in Memorial Hermann Emergency Department where I worked. I could probably tell you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories of people's expression of hope and faith and spirituality as they beckoned their savior or called upon their higher power with pleading request. Many times I personally felt lost or incomplete as I told a parent or loved one the bad news. Fortunately, I was provided return experiences of offering good news, reversible diagnosis, and opportunity for repair. Now the last 12 years, I've dedicated my life and my career to, re to treating uh, and loving people who are infected with HIV and AIDS. At first, I didn't even know how to spell HIV. But with ample study and practice, I quickly evolved. In light of the media and people living in fear and judgment around me, I knew I was supposed to be afraid. I was supposed to look at these infected individuals as bottom of the barrel or marginal in moral character. I walked into Thomas Street Clinic on a Tuesday, slightly fearful, yet overtly aware. I made sure my white coat was clean, which I should have done today, um, and brought and made sure it was bright so that no one would mistake me for an HIV patient as I walked through those doors. Poor discernment on my part. I stood out like a fish flopping out of water. I felt like all eyes were on me wherever I walked, wherever I stood. Who is she? What is she doing here? The next day, my new team met at LBJ Hospital. The case manager in our group asked the lead physician what he was thinking to hire me. Not only did I not know the first thing about treating HIV, I didn't look like everyone else. I didn't look like anyone else in our entire practice. I was white. I clearly dressed above that of the patient population and must purposefully be trying to stand out. How are the patients going to react and respond to her, the case manager said. It was not the HIV patients being judged, it was me. My new boss, Dr. Stanley Lewis, told her to simmer down and give me a chance. She said, fine, let's see if she can handle Pam. She takes me into the room, Pam, a tattooed, gold-toothed, mean young woman, looks at me and looks at her, and she says, meet your new doctor, and turns around and walks out of the room and leaves me standing there. And Pam says, hell no. Where is Dr. Lewis? Get him in here now. Case manager shut the door. 45 minutes later, Pam and I walked out of the room arm in arm. Pam told them, she'll do. Pam and I spent many years together after that. We developed a great client-practitioner relationship. Since that encounter, I've taken care of thousands of people infected with HIV, and I've witnessed just as many sacred moments. I've listened to individuals work their way through every portion of the death and dying cycle, while the whole time they should be focusing on living. 
I've also listened to them as they work forward through life. I do not believe anyone asked to become infected with HIV and AIDS, nor do I think anyone intentionally sets out to infect another person with HIV. I do believe that this virus is caused to teach us how to love and respect one another regardless of skin tone, religious values, gender, sexual preferences, or socioeconomic level. Roughly five years ago, I was mentoring two students, Stuart and Sophia. I had just kicked off a new clinical trial, didn't have any money for nursing support. This meant I was actually in multiple roles, the sub-investigator, the study coordinator, the nurse, the phlebotomist. And Stuart and Sophia and I were enrolling our first patient in the study, and we'll call her Rosie. Rosie was an educated high school English teacher, in fact, and she seemed very low that day. As we questioned her about her recent adherence to medication, we learned that she had given up taking it. She was ready to just throw in the towel and quit her life. She was angry and confused as to why God would let this happen to her. She had led a straight and upward life. However, she is HIV positive. People avoided her, talked behind her back, fired her from jobs, all but killed her with shame. We spent a long while talking with her about her feelings that day. This, of course, was very new to Stuart and Sophia, these feelings that humans describe of rejection from other human beings based on a medical diagnosis. I drew her blood. I leaned in to give her a hug before leaving the room, and she shoved me away. She said, yelled, don't touch me. When I asked her why, she began to weep and told me that she didn't deserve to be touched and overtly expressed fear that I might get infected with her virus. I had to abruptly leave the room. I wanted to throw the tubes of blood at the wall. I wanted to smash them. I was boiling inside, furious that society, fear, and judgment could make a person feel this way. I couldn't hold back my tears. I was angry, I was hurt, and I was disappointed. Sophia and I eventually returned to the room. I wanted her to see my tears of grief for her. I wanted her to know that I loved her and that God did not do this to her. We talked about faith, healing, medicine, and hope. Sophia, who was probably just 19 at the time and brand new to the world of HIV, sat weeping with us. She moved in from the corner where she was observing and with open arms asked Rosie for a hug. They shared this wonderful moment of love and compassion before me. Today, Rosie helps run an HIV-positive woman support group. She's been infected for at least 20 years and is helping provide hope and guidance to others who have fallen into the same trap. So let me bring you back to Saturday. I completed the 26.2 miles on Saturday to honor my best friend, Angela Mortazavi. She has stage 2 B, triple negative breast cancer. Angela was diagnosed with cancer on a routine screening in January of this year, and that was just two days prior to me leaving the country to, to Guatemala for medical missionary work. The diagnosis shattered our glass house. As I spent my last moments preparing to leave for my trip, Angela, who's never discussed religion, let alone prayer with me over our eight-year friendship, asked me to have my group pray for her while we were away. She specifically said, I want you guys to pray for me down there because I know that's what you do there. The urgency of her need and the relevance of her request was palpable. Of course we'll pray, I tell her, and we did. We prayed every day and we continue to pray. Angela's three months into her four and a half month weekly chemo regimen and looking and doing great. She's still faced with surgery and radiation, but she's finding great strength in prayer while now living in medicine. After completing those 26.2 miles on Saturday, I turned around and got up the next morning to begin another 13.1. My joints were aching, my feet were throbbing, but my heart was bleeding for Angela. 
I needed people to see that cancer is devastating, and with a little awareness and a lot of hope and continuous prayer, it might be overcome. I left Rice Stadium once again thinking, I can do this. I have strength, I have courage, and I just took four Advil. <laughs> Even though, just in case, I better say a little prayer, so I began muttering one as I pushed my way to the front of the pack. Each mile marker I passed seemed farther between. I was a little lonely, even though I was mostly surrounded by others on the same mission. At mile nine, I thought my feet were literally going to fall off, let alone fail me, when my phone rang. It was Angela. She said, you should be nearing a Walgreens at Studewood. I'll meet you there. As I approached, there she was, all decked out in her workout clothes prepared to walk those last four miles with me. It had been just three days since her last chemo treatment, and the third day historically is her worst. But she, there she was, coming to encourage me and to help me complete my mission. My feet were literally bleeding through my shoes. I was ready to fall to the ground, but the glowing light surrounding Angela, her strength, her courage, and her determination to beat cancer's butt carried me across the finish line, arm in arm with her. Angela's attitude toward her medical treatment, her attitude toward those who are trying to offer comfort and care toward her, has motivated my spirit to become even more aware and more reflective in nature as I care for my patients each day with medicine. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Thank you.